morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jiho Kim, and I'm the Vice President of the LSE uh, Korea Future Forum. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce you to the opening keynote speaker of the 2016 Forum. Mr. Frederick Eriksson is the co-founder and director of ESIP, the European Center for International Political Economy, one of the leading world economy think tanks in the world based in Brussels. In 2010, he was ranked as one of Brussels' 30 most influential people by the Financial Times. In addition, he is the author of several books and studies in the field of international economics, economic policy, and regulatory affairs, including welfare reforms and healthcare competition policy. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Frederick Erickson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and many thanks for the very kind introduction to me to come and, and, and speak here this morning. Um, um, the talk at, um, I'm, you know, I'm really fascinated to see that there are uh, such a great number of people that have, have come here today to, uh, uh, to listen to the uh, subject of EA Korea uh, economic integration. Um, uh, I happen to be a former student of this, uh, of this school. Um, uh, when I was here, uh, I'm not going to say when, because then they're going to treat me as an old dinosaur, because uh, I'm very young. Uh, um, when, but when I was here, uh, Korea didn't represent the largest student body. Uh, if I re remember correctly, uh, the largest non-EU uh, group of students here at the LSE when I was a student was Norwegian. Uh, and after that, American. Um, and it's amazing to see uh, uh, the number of, of both Korean and, and other Asian um, people here today and, and how that reflects, of course, how, how the world has changed and how now uh, Korea is, and Korean students are also um, top in the world when it comes to uh, being at, at the world's uh, leading universities. Um, I have another fond memory from my time here as well because even if the Korean student population here at the university was very small. Uh, I happened to find one of them uh, who later became Mrs. Ericsson. Um, and uh, so in that way you can say we have practiced good integration uh, even in my private affairs between Europe and Korea. And I can tell you it has worked very well. So if that means anything for uh, the free trade agreement between uh, Korea and the EU, uh, uh, that's good news. What I'm going to do here today is to talk a little bit about um, um, this free trade agreement, uh, which is now into, uh, uh, soon into its sixth year. Um, and I'm going to put it in context because you're going to listen to several other speakers after me who will uh, speak more uh, 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 about specific issues in, in trade and investment relation between Korea and the EU. Um, you will also hear uh, speakers like uh, Theo Bok, Signe Rapso uh, from Korea and the EU that can uh, also uh, go into uh, uh, into greater depth in many of the issues uh, that I'm uh, just uh, briefly will comment in my introduction. So I'm going to begin by saying uh, something about a free trade agreement, what it is. Uh, I understand that uh, most of you uh, have not come here with a PhD in trade economics. So I'm going to just going to give you uh, more of a, a, a brief sketch about what you usually do in a free trade agreement. Uh, I'm going to speak about the motivation for this particular FTA between the EU and Korea, um, especially looking at the broader context around uh, the FTA, what changes in the world uh, that led both sides to uh, begin considering an FTA. Then I'm going to talk about the impact of the FTA, uh, looking at uh, the impact on trade. And finally, I'm going to uh, uh, end up with a couple of notes about uh, EU Core, which is the, uh, uh, the acronym for the EU Korea Free Trade Agreement and how it links up with other FTAs and with uh, broader trade policy in the world. All right, so what is a free trade agreement? 
To present it in very brief terms, it is a bilateral trade agreement which is entered usually between two countries. A, a free trade agreement should be all-encompassing in, in the way that it should cover substantially all trade, usually defined as trade in goods. And that comes as not a very stern, but at least uh, a condition uh, from the World Trade Organization rules and what you need to do in order to not following one of the core principles of the World Trade Organization, which is called uh, uh, Most Favored Nation Principle, or MFN, which basically means that the privileges or the market access that you extend to one other country should automatically be extended to every other country which is a member of the World Trade Organization. So that's one of the core post-war principles of trade agreements, the MFN. If you want to depart from that rule, you can only do it conditionally. And the condition is that if you sign a free trade agreement, which, and this is the third point, offers mutual ma market access on preferential conditions, then that agreement needs to cover substantial all trade. You can't just pick out and say, we are going to have an agreement which just is going to open up for uh, free trade in, let's say, auto components, or in pharmaceuticals, or in, 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 in textiles and garments. If you want to do this sort of agreement and comply with WTO rules, you need to cover substantial all trade. Now, there are many free trade agreements in the world that I would say are not following that principle, and as most members of the World Trade Organization have been erring on the side of, uh, of, 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 of erring on the wrong side of this principle, <coughs> they haven't been that keen to, uh, uh, to uh, correct this practice either. Um, um, but it largely means that when you, <coughs> when you go and sign this sort of agreement, you try to do them as large as possible and cover as many sectors as possible. Now, on the basis of what I've said now, we can also add a fourth addition to uh, what is a free trade agreement, and that's him. Um, you can say that for people with a very, or with a purist idea of trade policy, a purist multilateral or economic idea of trade policy, free trade agreements are the equivalent to the Lord Voldemort or the Darth Vader's of trade policy. This is an entity which comes with, from this malicious empire trying to strike right at the heart of the Republic of Free Trade and destroying some of the core principles that should power the world economy and trade policy. So that is why you're going to find a lot of economists that are going to be very skeptic, if not downright hostile to the idea of a free trade agreement for the simple reason that such agreements are not open to each and every country in the world. And if it's not open to each and every country in the world, you will find bad consequences to come from such agreements. For instance, you're going to change the competitive relation between different countries because one country may have access to another country on free trade conditions, while the other country will not. And let's say if the other country is a much more efficient producer of a good, and much more efficient than the first country. So, broadly speaking, if there were free trade, it's the other country that would trade in, in, that, one, in that particular area. But because of a free trade agreement, you can reor reorient that competitive relation so that the first country does the trade rather than the second country. So you can have the effect where you go from more efficient producers to less efficient producers as a consequence of free trade agreements. That's the sort of purest economic idea uh, or economic 
principle that you can see entering into many analyses around free trade agreements. And it goes back to a long discussion beginning uh, in the mid-war period about what type of trade agreements you need in the world in order to avoid building into world trade uh, uh, irritants or larger structural problems which will have consequences on the competitive relations between countries. In ec economic speak, we, would talk, we talk about trade creation or trade diversion. So a good trade agreement is going to create a lot more trade. You're going to have deeper connections between economies as a consequence of a trade agreement. So that's the positive effect of a trade agreement. But you may also have trade diversion, and trade diversion is exactly what I was talking about before, that you reorient trade uh, not from an efficient producer to a more efficient producer, but usually from uh, an efficient producer to a less efficient producer. So for most economists, they're not going to begin the analysis of a free trade agreement from a very favorable position. They're usually going to start from the viewpoint that this may be causing new blockages in world trade and you can build in uh, problems in the arteries of, of trade in the world. Still, countries are doing free trade agreements and they are doing them en masse. And why are they doing this then? Well, firstly, they do it because it's part of a larger economic agenda in order to boost not just trade but economic growth. Governments believe it's in the interest of their population to advance trade agreements to boost economic growth and, and to raise prosperity. And that you do, of course, through the normal mechanisms of trade. You can build up scale advantages. You can get specialization advantages. You can use your basic endowments, your talents, your natural resources, uh, your capital, in a better way when you advance free trade. So that's the, I would say, the core motivation behind why countries are doing uh, uh, free trade agreements. The other core motivation is they want to correct disadvantages that they have from other free trade agreements. So to give you an example, uh, the European Union was actually very keen to sign a free trade agreement with Korea. And it was keen for a host of reasons, one of which were that Korea was negotiating a free trade agreement with the United States. And if the United States-Korea free trade agreement would have come into force, without EU having the same access to the Korean market as American producers, it would have meant that American producers exporting to Korea would have been in a far more disadvantaged uh, advantaged position compared to EU producers that wanted to export to Korea. So correcting for disadvantages that have uh, emerged when other countries have signed FTAs is a second strong motivation. A completely different set of reasons for doing FTAs will come through politics and usually through different sort of geostrategic analysis about what type of countries do you want to have for political reasons a closer relation to. So you do them as basically sign of friendship and as a down payment for other political benefits that you want to get from being close to another country. And that form of geostrategic bonding, when you look to the broad patterns of different free trade agreements in the world, you will find around certain group of countries of which, of course, the United States and the European Union are two centers because Many countries have also, for political reasons, favored getting a closer political relation to these countries. 
So for instance, United States signed a free trade agreement with uh, Jordan uh, in, in, in the 2000s. Now, as you can imagine, at least from the viewpoint of the United States, they didn't calculate that there would be large economic benefits from a free trade agreement between the United States and Jordan. But they wanted to foment and strengthen a political relation that existed there, and the United States thought it could derive larger geostrategic benefits from that particular agreement. The first entry point to the European Union for countries that either want to become a member or associate themselves with the EU has been a free trade agreement. And there are many economic logics behind that, such as if you are a fairly small economy in the outskirts of the European continent, it certainly makes sense to have virtually free trade conditions in your relation with the large market which is sitting next to your border. But it also makes political sense to do it, that you, uh, uh, you're going to build that larger strategic uh, connection which eventually may mature into, for instance, membership of the European Union. So for instance, when after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, many of the countries that then freed themselves from the Soviet yoke signed very quickly, or just a few uh, after years after uh, independence or, or, or freedom, uh, free trade agreements with the EU. And they became later uh, association agreements with the EU, and then they became full members. There is another political reason you could add as well, which is uh, development conditions, that you uh, sign free trade agreements because you want to help to spur economic development in regions of the world which are poor. So many economies therefore have, uh, have had free trade agreements or free trade agreements like <coughs> relations with, for instance, uh, uh, ACP countries. Uh, in order to uh, help them to uh, spur economic growth. So we can talk about three different tracks then of, of trade policy. And I'm, I'm saying this in order that we need to try to sort of fit in where uh, FTAs come into the larger picture of trade policy. You have as first track what you can call autonomous liberalization. And you can say, it's based on the principle from Nike, which is just do it. So you liberalize your trade autonomously. You don't do it because you're negotiating with another country. You do it because you believe it's in your economic advantage to open up your country regardless of what other countries are going to make, uh, uh, what choices they're going to make about their trade policy. Through the 1980s, 1990s, in the broad wave of trade liberalization uh, that happened then, autonomous liberalization was the most important track and vehicle of trade liberalization in the world. It wasn't trade negotiations that delivered uh, uh, many of the trade openings that happened. It was countries making their own choice that it is in our economic advantage to open up our markets. Then you have multilateral trade liberalization. For instance, the Doha round of trade liberalization in the World Trade Organization. And that is based on the principle of that we, we do it all together. All countries in the world, or at least all members of the WTO, almost representing all countries in the world, negotiate with each other about usually launch agreement covering many different sectors and many different rules and areas you have flexibilities for a certain group of countries uh, in order to make sure that they don't need to take on demands on trade rules and trade liberalization, which uh, they are not capable of. But this, of course, has been the crown in the jewel of trade policy. And that's why you have sort of the, those people who believe FTAs to be Darth Vader-like type of 
of intuitions in trade policy, they usually come from the multilateral school of trade policy in the sense they believe trade policy should begin and end at the headquarter of the WHO in Geneva. And if you don't negotiate trade there, uh, it's going to be bad. Then you have the third component, which is FTAs, or preferential liberalization, which is I am I am I'm only going to liberalize my market for you if you liberalize your market for me. Now, it is the dominant form of trade policy and trade negotiation in the world because for a variety of reasons, FTAs now are considered to be uh, the most realistic vehicle of trade liberalization in the world. And you will find that both Korea and the European Union are extremely active players in negotiating these type of agreements with other countries in the world. Now this gets into the motivation for why the EU-Korea agreement uh, uh, get uh, off to the start. Because at least for, uh, for, the U for Europe, uh, they had put free trade agreements and new negotiations of that kind uh, in a deep freezer from the late 1990s up to the point when it uh, uh, started FTA negotiations with South Korea. And they put it in the freezer because they wanted to give all the attention and focus the attention of other countries in the world as well on the Doha round, which was launched in 2001 and was then um, uh <coughs> the, the round in the World Trade Organization that was to, supposed to continue from the Eurogai round, which had ended in 1994, and the in, Eurogai round agreement entered, in, uh, entered into force in, in, two, in 1995. But quickly, the Doha round get into troubles, or got into troubles. And the troubles uh, were partly expected, partly not expected, but it basically meant that you had a lot of negotiation activity in the Doha round, basically up to 2004 and 2005. Then it largely took a large break, or at least it was perfectly obvious that very little was going to happen in, in, in this negotiation for a while. They tried again to revive it in, in 2008, but it didn't manage to close it then. And of course they tried to revive it on a number of occasions uh, during the time of economic crises because uh, boosting trade would have been uh, a good uh, uh, recovery strategy, uh, government leaders uh, thought. Um, but never, they never managed to finish the Doha round. A couple of years ago, there was a specific agreement called the Bali Agreement in the World Trade Organization, which covered largely trade facilitation issue, which they sort of they picked out one particular co component of, of the Doha round and, and agreed to it. In December last year, just before Christmas, countries made agreement about a few other elements which were in the Doha round. Um, 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 but that agreement, or sort of in, in, in at that summit in Nairobi last year, uh, there was also, uh, uh, it ended uh, uh, on a note of confusion as a number of countries in the world no longer wanted to re reaffirm the Doha mandate. And the Doha mandate, not reaffirming the Doha mandate basically means that they're not, they're not interested in continuing negotiating the Doha round. So in that sense, when the vehicle of multilateral trade liberalization didn't work, countries began to look for other alternatives and free trade agreements uh, was then staring them in the face. Partly also because the world has changed to such a large degree from the time when they closed the Uruguay Round Agreement uh, in the mid 1990s up to the mid 2000s or late 2000s. The entire sort of reorientation of the world economy uh, if you're sitting in this part of the world, towards the east had, of course, accelerated at an enormously fast speed back then. Technological changes had created 
a lot more trade in products or services that simply didn't exist at the time of uh, the closing of, of the Uruguay Round Agreement. Even after the Uruguay Agreement, there was uh, 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 another agreement called ITA that was signed on, on uh, in, you can call it well, information technological goods, um, um, which largely covered things like floppy disks, if you remember them, um, search engines didn't exist when the relevant agreements were signed. Most of the digital services that we now enjoy, they didn't exist. So real changes in the world economy also prompted governments to begin to look for agreements where you could tackle a lot of problems, especially in regulation, that exist around new type of trade and new type of productions. So that change and sort of the outdated nature of existing multilateral agreements combined with the huge reorientation of the world economy forced countries even more to look for FTA and, and uh, find other ways to deal with these issues. And that came into the uh, analysis that were done by, by both uh, Korea and the EU. Now, Korea was much more, I'd say, active and far more offensive in trying to flesh out a strategy for FTAs than the EU. Korea began with a roadmap for FTAs in 2003, which sort of not just signaled uh, what its interests were, but also what parts of the world and what countries it wanted to negotiate FTAs with. And that was, of course, part of an economic strategy for trade and growth, for economic, uh, continued economic modernization in Korea. And they also wanted to have free trade agreements uh, uh, in order to get better market access to liquid markets in the world, like, for instance, uh, the United States in what has been called the Corus Agreement. Um, they also understood that the geographic location of Korea close to China and close to an enormously fast-growing economy, which is so populous that it's going to become very dominant in the East Asian region. That meant that for economic and political reasons, it was in South Korea's interest to find strategies for diversification when it comes to what countries in the world it's trading and integrating with. For Europe, there were similar arguments or similar reasons uh, uh, that, that led to the conclusion uh, that they wanted to do this free trade agreement. They wanted to uh, correct future effects on the EU economy and on EU producers exporting to Korea from the agreement between Korea and the United States. They considered this agreement to be a main plank in a larger strategy for getting better access to Asian markets. They wanted to have a strategic coalition with a progressive country in Asia, and by progressive I mean a country that you can sign uh, agreements with which cover issues of economic modernization, but also political issues around sustainability, the environment, uh, labor regulations, etc. And hopefully by doing that, trying to set a template for what sort of trade agreement that Europe also wanted to sign with other countries in Asia. And this became part of uh, what was then called Europe's trade strategy, Global Europe, which became a big, which represented a very big change in Europe from looking at FTAs as nothing we should do while we're negotiating a multilateral trade round to having a very intense and comprehensive strategy for FTAs. Korea was the first country uh, 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 which they launched FTAs with, and that FTA became part then of what is called the Global Europe Strategy. So Korea, 
ASEAN countries and uh, Mercosur countries in Latin America. These were sort of the three testing grounds for the EU in its ambition to negotiate uh, new FTAs with different parts of the world, but also ne negotiate FTAs uh, which could go into uh, many of those issues that prevented uh, good market access for European producers uh, uh, in, 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 in the world economy. So let us try to look at some of the consequences of, uh, of, of the EU-Korea agreement, in particular uh, the consequences for trade. And the main question, of course, when you ask, uh, when you look at an FTA like this, is sort of what impact can you find on trade flows as a consequence of a particular agreement? Well, in this case, it's not a very good question to ask because EU-Korea agreement entered into force in 2011, which was just a couple of years after the financial crises, which of course had a huge impact on trade volumes in, 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 in Europe and the world, which you can see uh, on this side. So from uh, around 2007-2008, you see uh, a huge drop in, in, in global trade volumes. Then you have a recovery again, which came in 2010 and 2011. But then came a drop again. And this slide here shows total trade between the European Union and, and Asian countries. With the red bar is exports, uh, the green bar is imports, and the blue bar is total trade. So we didn't just have the effect of the crises. We also had other effects which had entered into trade relations between the European Union and Asian countries, which are far more about structural changes in trade patterns than they are about cyclical uh, patterns. If you see here for a couple of countries like China, Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia, you will find that uh, uh, for China, Korea, India, there's been a big change in trade policy. This is between, uh, uh, I'm thinking says, you know, 2005 and 2011. In the case of China, it almost doubled uh, the volume of trade between 2005 and 2011. From 2011 to 2013, it dropped. It dropped in Japan, it dropped in India, it dropped with Indonesia, but it didn't drop with Korea. So between 2011 and 2013, Europe's trade with Asian countries dropped, but it didn't drop with Korea. For other countries, one of the main reasons why trade dropped was, of course, that we got into the Eurozone crisis, and demand in many EU countries dropped as a consequence, which meant they were demanding less export products from other countries. That, however, don't explain why Europe's export to many Asian countries also dropped, because they were not in a crisis. They actually had many very good years doing, uh, during uh, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013. Yet, EU export dropped. I'm going to explain this a little bit later why on, on the structural reason. But the main reason or the main thing we should remember right now is that total trade between EU and Korea didn't drop. It actually increased uh, uh, during, during that time. Here you can see uh, EU goods exports and imports with Korea between 2007 and, and 2014. And here you can see, of course, that the EU, uh, the EU's exports, which is the green bar, has increased quite significantly to Korea, uh, 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 also as uh, a consequence of, of uh, the free trade agreement in, in 2011. What you can also see, of course, is that Korea's uh, export to the EU has been uh, not going in a very straight direction. And from one year to another, you can actually see that Korea's exports to Europe declined during the years after the entry of 
the FQ. So you have that very unorthodox or very strange situation, which is that after you're signing a free trade agreement, you would find that your exports to another country drop. You would usually find a completely different pattern, of course, but this is explained by the crisis in the EU and the fact that demand was so muted, especially for the type of products that Korean companies usually exported to, uh, to, to Europe. If you look at different kind of product categories, we will see that you generally have had uh, uh, a growth in EU imports across the board. Uh, for some categories, the growth has been larger than for others, for instance, in chemicals and manufactured goods or uh, uh, crude materials, for instance. Um, uh, you will also find that EU exports to Korea has grown more in some sectors than in others. Um, uh, and for some of these categories, the growth has actually been much larger. Uh, but I, 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 I stopped them at the index value 180 because otherwise we would, wouldn't be able to see uh, the changes in other categories because the effect has been so large. In some areas, you've seen EU export to Korea uh, uh, to have grown by six, seven times uh, between 2011 and, and, and 2014, which of course is uh, uh, a very big uh, change. Yet still, um, even if we've seen this sort of, at least for the EU, uh, uh, sort of expected effects of, of larger uh, trade growth than, than uh, previously. Um, we haven't seen a big change in the pattern of trade in what type of goods and services that you trade with. It's still typically concentrated to uh, uh, a, a few categories, usually here. Manufactured goods, machinery, and transport equipment. These are by far the two outstanding areas when it comes to trade volumes between uh, EU and Korea. And you will find that they are outstanding for both EU and Korea. So both are exporting to each other much more in that category than in ever any other category. Yet, we didn't see a reorientation of the patterns of trade between EU and Korea as a consequence. We have seen that those areas that were liberalized faster, where tariffs or other type of trade barriers were phased out immediately, in contrast to those trade barriers that was going to be phased out over time. And there are still trade barriers between EU and Korea that remains to be phased out. So all components of that trade agreement, they haven't kicked in yet. But in those areas where liberalization was deeper and happened faster, you saw trade growing much faster than trade in other sectors, which largely means that um, uh, the FTA itself had an intended effect. You cut down tariffs, you cut down trade barriers in order to boost growth. And in those sectors where growth were boosted, that's also when, when, when trade arrived. So wrapping this up and looking at the EU Korean FTA and just picking out a couple of salient points and putting them in comparison with other FTAs, this agreement is an early example of what you can call second generation free trade agreements in the sense that it's agreement, an agreement which doesn't just cover tariffs and just doesn't cover goods, which typically have been the central plank of all FTAs in the past. This agreement goes into issues which are called NTBs, which stands for non-tariff barriers. So this is barriers to trade, which is not represented by a tariff that is applied at the border on trade with another country. 
these are other type of trade barriers that discriminate or prevent uh, trade. This is now, I would say, the central plank of many other FTAs that are either being negotiated or being considered right now that we have seen this shift from old type of trade negotiations focusing on tariffs to new type of trade negotiations focusing on NCBs or finding larger compatibility between regulatory systems in different countries. So this is the central plank of, of second generation free trade agreements today. The EU-Korea FTA was based on an asymmetric market relation between the two. The EU represents something like 19 trillion, an economy with the size of 19 trillion uh, US dollars. The Korean economy is around 1.4, 1.5 trillion US dollars. So you have a very large market like the EU's and you have a medium sized market like Korea. This has traditionally been one of the typical uh, trade agreements, of, of free trade agreements you've seen in the past that uh, smaller or medium sized economies want to associate themselves with larger economies. That's been one category. Another category has been small and medium sized economies doing free trade agreements with each other. Now we're seeing also uh, a much larger focus in the world on uh, uh, focusing or doing free trade agreements between larger economies like the United States and the European Union uh, or with China. Um, but you also see free trade agreements where you package countries together in order to avoid large asymmetrical uh, market relations between each other. So for instance, in an agreement like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, which was just signed last week, uh, you will find that a dominant economy like the United States doesn't become as dominant when it negotiates an agreement like this with a host of countries and not just with one country, but they do it on preferential terms which basically means the FTA principle that applies. Thirdly, the EU Korea agreement at pack peak protections in key sectors like automobiles, where you've had uh, protection either by tariffs or by NCBs, which were uh, uh, higher than in other sectors uh, in both the European Union and Korea. And as a consequence, you could see. Uh, uh, trade, of course, booming in, in those sectors where peak protection was either eliminated or reduced. Um, fourthly, it led to uh, an arresting, you arrested the long-term developments uh, when it comes to having falling trade chairs with each other between EU and, and Korea. Um, so for the EU, EU's role in Asian economies is rapidly declining. If you look, for instance, at uh, Asia's shares of imports, you can see here that the share of their imports coming from the European Union has shifted quite markedly between 1995 and 2013. So the EU is becoming less important, both as a destination for, for their exports, but also as the source of their imports. For Europe, of course, it's, it's, it's the other way around. Asian markets are becoming even more important for uh, both their exports and, and their imports. But this long-term decline has been arrested in the trade relation between uh, EU and Korea in the sense that Europe's role for Korean trade has stabilized and slightly increased and vice versa, Korea's role for EU's trade has also increased. So the trade agreement has the intended effect on the volumes of trades and relative relations, trade relations uh, in the world. Um, uh, and, and in that sense is a helpful tool to uh, produce more trade. Now, the question is, is all this trade, is it leading to much more economic gains? Does it lead to more more value added, more production, 
uh, more GDP, more prosperity? My answer to that question would be uh, yes, but I would also qualify such a statement with a couple of caveats. And those caveats would be related to the fact that there are disadvantages coming to free trade agreements of this kind. That in the EU Korea free trade agreement, we have seen trade erosion. And other countries have been disadvantaged by those, by those effects. Now, both Korea and the EU are trying to limit and reduce the, those negative consequences, predominantly by signing free trade agreements with those countries that were primarily damaged by uh, the Korean FTA. So the sort of logic, the dynamic of free trade agreements is that if you begin to sign them, you need to have a strategy for dealing with the consequences. And the strategy for dealing with consequences, you either do typically by other free trade agreements with other countries in the world, or you're trying to find ways to put the content of your free trade agreement into a multilateral trade agreement. So you multilateralize it, you internationalize it, you try to make those free, uh, freedom to trade principles to also uh, 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 be extended to other countries. That track of trade policy, multilateral, I think is largely closed for the foreseeable future. I don't think we are going to find any reasonable amount of trade liberalization to happen in the World Trade Organization, at least not for the foreseeable future, and by the foreseeable future, I mean the next couple of years, which largely means we are back to economic strategies by governments right now that are focusing on FTAs, and FTAs are becoming the main plank of trade policy in the world. 